welcome to Writing About Bipolar. Um, and this is one of those panels where the title kind of says it all, where everybody, uh, all of our panelists, um, have bipolar and talk about it in their memoir work and in very different ways. Uh, and we're kind of going to describe their process, their choices, um, when they started and felt compelled to talk about this and why. Uh, and um, we will begin, I think, uh, actually first, before I do that, let me introduce everyone. Um, let us begin with, immediately on my left, is Ellen Forney. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> let me read a little introduction. Cartoonist Ellen Forney is the author of best-selling graphic memoir, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me, and also Rock Steady, Brilliant Advice for My Bipolar Life, which is her new book. Uh, she was recently awarded the NAMI Washington Media Partner Award for those books, and Marbles was chosen as the 2018-19 Common Book for University of Washington Washington Health Sciences Schools. She curated a traveling exhibition about comics and health for National Library of Medicine, which is currently touring libraries and universities across the country. And she also collaborated on the National Award winning novel, National Book Award winning novel, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part Time Indian, and was awarded residency fellowships from McDowell Colony, Civitello Ranieri, and Hedgebrook. She grew up in Philadelphia, lives in Seattle, and teaches comics at the Cornish College of the Arts. And is this your first appearance at SBX since back in the late 90s, or have you been here since? I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. I think you're correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, next to her is Kyla Roberts. Um, she just debuted a brand new book, Chlorine Gardens, with Koyama Press. She's also the author of um, Misery Land. Uh, and... Um, I can't, why did I blank on the Sunburning. Oh, yes, sunburning. Um, like the image of her on the co cover of the book that is disappearing, the memory of the title disappeared from my brain. <laughs> um, and also many, many comics. And you, she is a professor at, um, are you at DePaul currently? No, I'm at the Illinois Art Institute, the school there. That's right. In Chicago. Um, and uh, has has been doing autobiocomics about... Um, motherhood, bipolar, family, and other issues for a number of years. And then uh, next to her is Lawrence Lindell, uh, who's been doing uh, <laughs> um, uh, who's, who's done another mini, number of mini comics, including um, Because I Can't Afford Therapy, I Did This. And, uh, and each artist has a completely different um, graphical approach, and uh, I want to begin with Ellen, uh, and especially in reference to marbles. Um, marbles is all about kind of your initial journey in discovering bipolar and what it meant for you, and from denial to acceptance, and uh, <clears throat> what compelled you to start writing about it and documenting it, um, and at what point did you start writing about and document it after you'd been diagnosed? So you mean marble specifically? Yeah. Rock study. Well, uh, I was diagnosed bipolar in 1998, and actually I didn't resist the diagnosis when I got it. That was part of it. It just kind of sunk in and like, oh, oh you know, right. And so. Um, in, uh, in the four years after that, my struggle to get stable is what made mm. the material of, of marbles. And so um, I, started, I started thinking about doing it um, back pretty early when I was still in that tumultuous time of trying to figure out how I was going to be balanced. And there was, so there was something... So there was something ridiculous. I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a dark sense of humor. Um, it's kind of how I get through the tough times, and it's how I tell stories, and it's very disarming, and I could go on and on about humor um, and how important it is. But anyway, um, 
I would say it was probably the early 2000s when there was something going on, like I, like I was having trouble remembering my lithium, but then I couldn't remember if I'd remembered my lithium, and it just seemed really absurd, and I, and I knew that, I kind of knew that what I was going through was really important, and also weird and funny, and that I was going to have to deal with it in a comic, because I'm a cartoonist, it's just how, it's how my stories come out of me. Um, sometimes people ask, why did you do it in comics? I'm like, because I'm a cartoonist. You know, it's like what I, it's like how things come out. Um, but it, but uh, up until Marbles, I had always been, I guess, what I would consider a graphic essayist. I had never done a full-length book. So I had to wait. I didn't start even writing the book proposal until 2008. I felt like I needed to be, I guess, stable enough in my stability that I would be able to um, kind of... Um, do that kind of self-exploration that I knew was going to be a tough road, as well as coming out in such a major way, because I, I really wasn't out, believe it or not, not really super out before Marbles came out. So it's a pretty, pretty big deal, a uh, pretty big shift in thinking about um, how I was going to interact in my world, friends, strangers, professionally. Um, so... Um, so I had I had really started thinking about it early on, but then it really took me it took me a while um, before actually getting started on the book itself. So I... Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Kyla. I know that in your work, talking about being bi bipolar was a decision that you were uncomfortable with at a certain point. I remember in reading your comics about it, you said not necessarily for reasons of you know, shame or necessary, but you're necessarily, but rather, you felt like you'd be boring your audience if you talked about that. Can you talk about the decision to actually do it and what's kind of led from that in your comics and how you feel about it, and also um, uh, what kind of response uh, you've received from others, peers, and family in in writing about these things? Um, I think that the problem with writing about bipolar is that it goes on. You don't like get over it and just stop. Um, and I had to get to a point where I felt like stable enough to write about it um, and stable enough to come to something like this, you know, and like be in front of people and stable enough to teach a class without, you know, crying <laughs> in the middle of it. Um, so when I felt like safe in that, then you put yourself out there and hope that people aren't like watching you, <laughs> you know, oh, here it comes, she's going to fall apart. Um, so there's a huge difference between putting something in a book and showing yourself, like, crying in a pile of laundry versus, like, trying to give a lecture on perspective and crying during the middle of it. Um, you just don't want to ever, that's the part that still has, um, like, this huge taboo around it, I think, is, um, I think it's okay to talk about everything, you know, it's safe and tidy, and that's part of my past, but um, to actually exhibit any th behavior that wouldn't be considered normal, you know, that's still, like, super embarrassing. Um, we all want to be in control of ourselves. Um, so the problem is, you know, bipolar, um, I mean, the reason I was diagnosed is because, like, it was a series of depressions, and when I talked to my psychiatrist, she's like, well, when does this start? I'm like, well, I don't know, I was in high school, and then I, I wrote a list of all the depressions I've had. <laughs> I was like, oh, there's one every single year for 10 years. <laughs> um, so she's like, I think you don't just have you know, depression, and then we got into the hypomania and stuff. Um, the, so I had to get to a point where I felt like there is enough distance between, you know, the hell that happened most recently and, like, where I am right now so I can write about this and I can see what's funny and interesting about it because when I'm in it, I mean, depression is defined by nothing is interesting anymore. You're, you're detached from everything. You don't feel like communicating. You're, you know, you don't have a perspective. Um, so that's not, like, the part of my brain that I write from and, you know, create from, so I had to get out of that. Um, and, you know, I go back into it, and so, like, during that time, if I'm going through a depression or something, um, I just know myself now, I become less verbal, and I focus more on drawing or something, you know, without even any word balloons at all, and I, like, let myself express myself in a different way or, or do other things, you know, go back and forth. Um, people's reactions, that was, uh, you yeah. know, it was a long question, Rob. 
<laughs> I, fi- I figured you can keep up with me. <laughs> I think so. Um, I mean, I think it's been really helpful for my students, you know, um, just because, like, I have a lot of students that have uh, bipolar disorder, but also, you know, all kinds of shades of anxiety and depression, and, and there are art students. Um, so there's a, like, trying to figure out how to deal with the creative process and this going on. Um, I think it really helps them just to, like, have somebody who's willing to, like, say it out loud. And, you know, I, f- I took a mental health first aid training at the school, and I, I learned that it is okay to hug students. <laughs> that was one of my questions. Like, <laughs> am I going to get fired if I touch someone? And they were like, well, just ask first, <laughs> you know. Um, and Lawrence, I'm interested in, in how you started to explore this issue and... Uh, you know, it's, it's a question I'll ask everybody else as well, but um, what, what have you gotten out of being able to put this on paper? Because like you, you're kind of joking about, I can't afford therapy, so I'm going to try this. Does it actually help? Has it actually helped you? And uh, what kind of reactions have you received from it as, as well? And how have those reactions sort of motivated you to perhaps do more? Uh, yeah, so it's funny that you say that I'm kind of joking. Because it's not a joke. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't sure, yeah. but it, it was a jokey title, but yeah. it felt like too real. Yeah, no, I'm not like trying to get at you or whatever, but a lot of folks think when they pick it up, they're like, oh yeah, I couldn't afford therapy, so I made this, ha ha I'm like, no, nah, I'm for real, like, I can't afford therapy, so I made this. <laughs> and it does help because I don't have access to like health insurance and things like that. And so putting... The images and the words on the paper helps me know I'm not crazy, and it also helps me focus in a way that when I was in denial or, like, I grew up in the church, so we say, oh, no, you don't have bipolar, take it to Jesus, or pray it away. And it's like, no, like, I got to work through this. And so making comics has helped me not only work through it, but see that other people are like, yo, me too, I can't afford therapy, or I had therapy and it didn't work. And, yeah, so it helps me balance, and it's important to be balanced, because when you're off balance, everything is... Just chaos. Um, you, you mentioned that you actually have had, you know, response from others uh, if feeling the same way. Have you had negative pushback from people in your community? No. Um, even from the folks at first, they were like, oh, pray it away. Later, they'll come like, yeah, me too. But mm-hmm. I couldn't say it, and you articulated it for me, so thank you. So, no, it's like... Starting that conversation has been important, and it's like, I hate to say that it's a fortunate thing, because it's unfortunate that so many people relate to what I'm saying. Like, it feels good to be like, oh yeah, me too, but then you think about it, like, no, it shouldn't be, that's not how it's supposed to be. So I haven't got any negative response. It's it's like bittersweet, like, I'm glad I gave someone relief, but it, I shouldn't have to give them that relief in the first place. Yeah. 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 Uh, all three of you use humor as something powerful in your work, um, and are you know it's it's a, it's a natural part of your work, obviously, but it's also clearly a response. Um, and uh, sort of starting with Ellen, um, both in terms of marbles, but also uh, rock steady. Um, which is, as you said, it's, it's a book about coping with, with bipolar. How do you use humor as a strategy? Um, and how hard is it sometimes to access that sense of humor? Or is, it, or, is it, or is it something that's easy to access, or more easy to access because it can, humor can often come from a dark place? I think that, well, humor is one of my most effective coping strategies. Um, it's a way, it's a way to uh, kind of turn things around and get some perspective. Um, it's a way, certainly as a, as a, as a storyteller, to, um, to have a, have a, com- of a um, sort of a common touch 
something that taught. I'm sorry, I feel like I, I, was, I was only kind of half listening. I was just really thinking about what it was that you said. Can I just talk a little? Can we have a, like a little conversation here? Do I need to keep going no, on that? Actually, okay. please have a conversation. Um, I, I only ask questions just to fill time. So. You know, I think you're doing such important work. I have to be honest. I didn't know of your work before um, coming here and looking up your work when I was looking at you know who else was on the panel. Your work is so important. One of the things that I came across doing marbles and doing rock steady is a real dearth of um, people of color, and in particular men of color. Uh, and um, it's something that came up in the interviews that I did. Uh, I've gotten a lot of reader mail from um, marbles, a lot of people who are from therapists. And we were just talking about you know, like how it comes into play in therapy and readers with bipolar. Or, mm. um, but there was one letter that I got from a man who identified himself as a, as a black man in his 30s who had been diagnosed with bipolar around the same time as, as me, so like in his late 20s. And he wanted me to know that he really enjoyed it, b the book, but that he really wanted me to know that, um, that his experience had been very different from mine, that he didn't get the kind of support from his community and family that I had. Um, and um, just a very different sense of what his resources were, and that he hoped that uh, at some point, if I do more work about it, um, I, I would take that into consideration, which was really, I mean, that really resonated with me all the way through, and like, how, how am I going to tell other people's stories? Um, what am I going to do? And so, so it was really important to me in Rock Steady to um, to get other people's voices in. So um, I did a, a lot of research on um, communities of color, and exactly what you were saying. There's a lot of turning to religion, and then like figuring out how to balance, you know, like needing something that's more like Western treatment, and also realizing the the value of a faith community, and like kind of believing in some the sort of like the integration, which isn't really often supported by either of those groups, like the faith in the Western medicine, but the integrating that and affording it and, and all of those issues. Um, but definitely, like, hearing your voice um, is really, really super important, so I want you to thank, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Do I need to go back to that question, or can we go on? <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Actually, I want to. Um, a question I want to ask you in particular is: You did your big memoir in Marbles about this experience. Um, what motivated you to do Rock Steady? Was it because because of the response you'd been given? that it's like, I need to reach out and find ways to help other people with this. And right. it's not, this book is not therapy. It's more of, um, and, and it never, it doesn't pretend to be a substitute for therapy, but rather it's sort of like, it's almost the, the go-between between therapy or rather a guide for like daily living with therapy as part of it. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Um, so, so when I, when I finished, marbles, I really felt like that that was it. <laughs> Maybe that was all that I do. Certainly was the only, the last thing I was going to do, perhaps, that was autobiographical, about bipolar. Like, it really, like, took what felt like everything. Felt like what, everything. And so it took a number of years, um, a lot of reader response, um, that I really felt like I had helped a lot of people, that I wound up kind of moving into this position as kind of a mental health advocate. Um, and it has really become a direction in my career that I hadn't expected. So, um, so doing a lot of talks about, about my work and mental illness and, and, and finding there's this whole field called graphic medicine and it's comics about health. And it's fascinating and who knew? And if you're curious, if you, look up, if you just look up graphic medicine, you'll get graphicmedicine.org and you'll go there and you'll be like, oh, Oh my God! Um, it's like opening a door to a speakeasy. You don't know that there's anything there, and there's like all of these, you know, doctors and cartoonists and stuff inside. It's kind of amazing. Okay, so I heard from a number of people who told me that they that they used marbles like a manual, 
And it had been really important for me, to me, to put very specific tools into marbles. Like, not just, I tried CBD and it didn't kind of work. But to actually put, I, you know, I tried CBD and this was one exercise that worked. Here is the exercise. And so to actually put in very specific tools. And I found that really, that really satisfying. Like, I wanted to reach out to my team, my people, to people who wanted to understand my people, to caregivers, and to actually give these. And so, so I figured um, enough time had gone by that I was ready to do, to really delve into um, mental health and bipolar disorder specifically. And um, that I just, there was so much that didn't fit into marbles. Um, of course, you know, there's a lot that I learned since 2012. And then I love doing research. And I love organizing things that seem messy, it's, that are important to me. Um, and I, I feel like I can help with that. I'm like a, I'm, I'm a professional like all of these years. I mean, part of what we do as cartoonists is we edit things down and t like tell those things. And so, um, so I felt like I felt like I had more to offer, and I and I wanted to do that. <clears throat> um, Tyler, in your work, there's less of that advocacy and more of just an integration of of your mental health, which is mental health is just part of your daily life, but it's also very unflinching. And you mentioned that strip about. Um, you know, crying in a pile of laundry, which is up on the board right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's heartbreaking, but it's also hilarious because you have this, you know, like, you know, your husband is trying to be helpful and say, why don't you go for a walk? You know, because he knows it might be help helpful for your mental health. And you're crying, but you still say, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, is that an actual accurate quote of what happened at that moment? <laughs> yes, uh, it always is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can do your best passive aggressive maneuvers if you're in the fetal position. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> um, but in that moment, did you, did you, were you able to access the fact that what you just said was like really funny? Or, or did, is that something oh. that like in, it, it took time to think about? Oh yeah, I remember when I was in the fetal position. I said that uh, that was kind of amusing. Um, yeah, I I wiped my tears on the clean laundry, <laughs> and then asked where my notebook was. Um, I don't remember. I mean, <laughs> at some point I wrote it down, but I don't, you know, I don't remember the sequence. Um, I mean, I will say like. You know, largely my sense of humor goes away during certain times, but I'm used. I can like see things that are still funny, you know. Um, but it's like it doesn't help. It's not enough. Like even if you manage to laugh at like a really bad, stupid, dark moment, um, it's not enough to like bring you out of it. That's the I think frustrating thing. Um, I wanted to say something about um, Rock Steady when I read it. Um, I think one of the impacts that it has, and I read it after, you know, seven years of therapy and, you know, trying out a bunch of drugs and all this, and being in a pretty stable position myself. Um, so I, it wasn't like I needed to read it, you know, for a guide at that point. Um, it's, it really means something coming from somebody who's life experience is there and when you say things like you need to you know I need to watch my sleep schedule I need to be really careful about these things you know you avoid alcohol if you can you know because it helps those are all things like that make your life really uncool and they don't help you be a professional in any field, you know? Like, you're expected to be able to have a drink and mingle, you know, with other professionals and to stay up late and to, you know, travel and do all these things. And, I mean, those things are really hard for me to do. And I, you know, I went off all my medication lately. Um, but it was only because, you know, I felt like it was worth the risk at this point because I, you know... I'm always sober and I eat super healthy and I exercise regularly and I like I have everything in place and I have a really good therapist and I have you know a family that's supportive like I have every piece of the puzzle so I feel like all right you know I can take this you know other risk um, 
But I, I just think, like, especially your forward, because you had just had a medication change, like, everything was worked out. And then it's like, oh, there's a wrench in the works. And knowing that that is, like, real for this specific person who's writing this book, and then I'm going to read this voice and take me through the process, that really made it strong. Thanks. <laughs> no, I'm glad that resonated. I'm glad that resonated. And, to, I mean... We were, we were talking beforehand. One of the things that was really important to me, too, is that we self-help manuals have a tendency to be like, here are all the things that make sense. Here yeah. are all the things that are good for you. But not, you might mess up, you know, mm -hmm. or you might need to juggle your priorities. Like, what are you going to do Like, if, you go, if like, the rest of your coworkers go out for a drink? Mm -hmm. Or what if you have to travel and you have to deal with jet lag? I mean, you can't avoid life, you know, if you're going to live your own, do your thing, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's, um, it's being able to kind of take a look and organize, but then, but then also, you know, like, you know, like she said, I, I, I had a med change, you know, like, whoops, thought I had it all figured out, yeah. or, or, you know, like, for, like, one story in there about, um, not realizing that, um, the, 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 the pill that I thought I was taking, my Lamictal, generic was actually vitamin D for three days. And this was only not that many years ago. I was like so careful, like, ah, oh, you know, like, I know this stuff, but you still mess up, you know? And I realized, you know, like, okay, this could be dangerous. Totally embarrassed, but I'm gonna call my doctor. We talked it over, I went back on, and it was fine. That's part of taking care of yourself over the long term, because I mean, I was diagnosed and I kind of stabilized in my early 30s. But, you know, you have a lot of time to cover, yeah. you know? There's a lot longer, and there isn't, you don't really get to hear stories that aren't that kind of dramatic story arc. You know, like, ooh, I was, you know, like, I had a break, you know, the crisis, and then, you know, like, whew, you know, like, and now, now I'm okay, you know? <laughs> and that was, that was marbles. But, you know, that was another reason that I, that I wanted to do rock steady is to really acknowledge that, this, this is a long-term thing, you know. How do you how do you fold this into your life and and really make it feel like um, it's a it's an expression of your own self-help? Like how do you how do you how do you make it yours? Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Lawrence. I was wondering, you know, someone who doesn't have some of the supports that others do. Um, in addition to drawing, what are other ways that you find? Uh, to get help, to get supports, um, you know, uh, and you know, how difficult is it kind of to proceed? You know, because it, it, it sort of sounds like you've had to like kind of invent your own supports for a lot of things instead of having access to a system with you know medication and therapy and things like that, and um, uh, you know. How are, how are you able to sort of achieve this kind of stability in the same in the same way? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say I don't have support. It's just a lot of the support I had, they didn't have the understanding of what I was going through. So it was like they would show up in ways that was still kind of like hurtful and harmful, mm -hmm. but they didn't know what they were doing. That's a part of the reason I make comics too. So like for that side of the, so they could be like, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. Okay, let me stop. But I do music, uh, piano kind of soothes me, I play drums, I stay busy. Um, the depression doesn't hit me as hard as the mania does, and I've kind of channeled my mania into making comics, that's why I make so many of them. Mm. So it's like, if I'm already like, yeah, I'm like, all right, I'll just draw and like, you know, try to put it to use. Um, community, I got a good community in the Bay Area, in SoCal. Um, a lot of folks with mental health take care of each other out there and kind of look out for each other. Always have an open ear. Uh, I got a partner that helps kind of be like, yo, I'm tripping today. And, you know, just, it's community, but I don't have like, like I don't have a therapist. I don't take medication. Um, these books are the thing that kind of keep me sane, if you will. Like, which is a fortunate thing because some people don't have anything to keep them sane. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not me being down on myself. Like, I'm fortunate to be able to make comic books about mental health and it impact me in a, like, good way because some people don't have that at all. And, yeah, it's comics and then, like, stuff like this. Like, y'all being here, 
I see the little nods and the smiles. Like for me, that's everything because I understand. Just looking at you, like I see, like okay, like I'm not alone. You're not alone. We understand. Like, and I feel like something's happening every time I go to a show, and someone picks up my book and they go, "Oh man, I get it." Like that's everything. Like sometimes you don't have that. Like when I was at my lowest and I was like locked away. I didn't have those voices that were like, yeah, me too, it's gonna be okay. I was just in my head like, oh, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And so, these things, like, me having access to stuff like this is what's important. Like, I came in from Oakland, like, you know, I'm from Compton, but I came in from Oakland. I didn't think I would be at SBX on a panel. Like, I do mini comics and self-publishing. Like, I don't have, you know what I mean? It's just as important, but having access and being able to tell my story and then folks that are also within the scene, they're like, yo, I was looking for something like this all these years. Kind of keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that was like a tangent circle thing, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's bipolar, it's, so it's how my mind functions, so. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you selling your comics here mm -hmm. upstairs? Yeah, table, Where are you? Uh, M13B. Oh. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Be there. M thirteen B. I'm next to. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to mess up people's names. But I'm there. I'm you're, next, there. you're next to Lara Ab Abdul Razak. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, don't know. I don't like butchering people's names. So. But yeah, um, yeah. You can come find me. I'm nice. I look mean, but I'm, I'm really nice. <laughs> um, in in this in the strip I have up there, you talk. You uh. You talk about opening up about your mental health five years ago. My question for all of you is, how did your life change when you became open about this? And um, we can start with Ellen and go on now. Wow. Uh, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. How did it change? Um, well, I mean, I mean, certainly, like I, w I was talking about, that I've, I've wound up focusing on on mental health in my professional life. It w I wind up being like kind of the professional bipolar person, you know, like you know, you know, getting you know, like giving advice. I don't know, like Dan Savage's Savage Love Show. Like I was the one that was giving advice. Um, but on a personal level, being out has just been so freeing. And to be so publicly out, and I also feel really kind of lucky in that I have, um, I have the opportunity to say it a lot. Because one really kind of benign question that we all get all the time is, so what do you do? And I get to say, I'm a cartoonist, which is something that I've always loved to say anyway. Oh really, um, what do you do? What, what might I know of your work? And then I get to say right away, well, I did a um, you know, graphic novel, graf graphic memoir, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me. So that's a little introduction. It's about my bipolar disorder and what that's meant to me as an artist. Maybe that's all, maybe I don't even say that. And, and I swear, like, I, w I wish that I could give to like every person who deals with a mental illness the, the, like, the gift that I have gotten by being able to say that because Me Too comes out all the time. Like, like, like I'm bipolar too, or I deal with depression also, or um, my mother, my lover, my... Uh, I mean, statistically, um, let's say, I mean, depending on what statistics you go by, uh, about one in 10 people have a mood disorder. And it's a lot more if you talk about mental illness in general. So if you know nine people, there are nine people close to you, then one of you is statistically likely to have a mental disorder. It's close to everybody. We don't have that many chances to talk about it, which is, you know, understandable. It's not something that you go around, you know, that, that, that kind of that kind of thing. It's, you know, pretty personal. So uh, it's not like I think we should talk about it all the time necessarily, um, that it's stigmatized is kind of like where that problem comes in. But as someone who is clearly open about having bipolar, and I've done work on it, I think that people feel rightly so that they can, that they can just kind of come out 
themselves. It's been, it's been, uh, it's a kind of a, a really uh, sometimes overwhelming experience. It took me, it took me a little while to get used to it, to figure out how to interact with that when people would just like, oh yeah, really, me too. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, thanks for signing my book. My mother was bipolar and killed herself when I was 14. Um, but you know, thank you for the work you do. Bye, see ya. You know. Um, and, and to just realize just how, how, how important it is for us all to know that we have company and, and that I've kind of like figured out how to carry that, that carrying, carrying other, other people's sense of needing this kind of community and understanding is something that I didn't realize was going to be a part of my kind of reaching out in a, in a way or hope, hoping that it, that it went out, when it, like that, that message went out okay. Absolutely. Kyla? All right. So how has my life changed since I came out about it? Yeah. Um, well, sunburning, no. I guess it was at misery land. Yeah. Um, so I got a new job from it, a new teaching job. And, you know, my I felt like I was able to become more honest and open with um, just everybody, people on Facebook, you know, friends. Um, and... I started to make a lot of money, and I got super successful. And um, I, I, I was like happy for a little while, um, and then I got sick of that, um, and I needed to have another book. So then I got MS. Um, so I <laughs> have something to write this book about, um, and now I'm working on a book about ringworm. <laughs> <laughs> Never ends. <laughs> Look for it in 2019. I, I await your encore. <laughs> no, it doesn't make you any money. Um, one of the things, this is off topic a little bit, but just like when you're struggling, when you're having too much anxiety or panic attacks or whatever it might be, um, I'm sure many of you have heard the great advice, um, get help. Uh, um, and I'm going to help. <laughs> um, but it's like, how? How do I get help? I finally figured out like the help I need is for there to be like a strip mall um, where anytime you're feeling bad, you can go there and get a massage or sit in a hot tub and have someone hug you and pet a bunch of puppies, have a delicious meal, and then just be able to cry publicly as much as you need to. And then you're done. <laughs> and maybe there's a library there too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you've hit upon your, your million dollar idea, and yeah. it's time to get on that. <laughs> well, I think we have our own strip mall, you know? Like, I, like that, li that list of yours is an yeah. important thing for you to know. And like one of the things that I really like to, like to um, emphasize is that, you know, like our disorders are all different. Like they manifest themselves in really super different ways, and what it is that comforts us in different situations. Yeah. No, know, knowing that kind of thing, I, I think I think maybe now there is there are some people who are like, oh, that's right, pet puppies. You know, I gotta remember <laughs> the pet puppies. But uh, but that's a great image, and that just like something um, that w that would be that would be worth like really thinking about. This this is this is my battery. This is my tool belt. This right. is you know. And then, Lawrence, same question for you about how your life has changed. Um, it freed me. Um, yeah, I remember the, my previous partner I was with, my ex. When I told them, I was so scared to just be like, yo, this is why I'm tripping. I have bipolar as well as PTSD, anxiety, and it's like a bunch of mental things. Because when you tell people that automatically, like whether they say it or not, we've been taught like, oh, he's crazy, that type of thing, you know? And like, who wants to be crazy? Nobody wants to be crazy. I'd rather be an asshole than crazy back then, not now. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that, like, like how it was manifest, like it just wasn't good for me. Like, yeah, it's it's perfectly fine for me to be a dick than it is to be crazy, and that's not okay. So like when I told her, and then she was like, oh yeah, I kind of knew something was like, whatever. And she's like, so what do you want to do? Do you want to get help? Like that was just, like she could have been like, oh yeah, we, we got to break up. But it was like, oh, do you want to get help? Or like, how do you? And 
And I was like, all right, maybe I'll tell some more people. And they're like, yeah, I'm not tripping. You know, we know you. What do you want to do about it? And it was free to have that out of my mind that like, oh, people are going to think I'm crazy. To go from like, I kind of like took, took it back, you know? Like, now I own it. Like, oh, I got bipolar, I have PTSD. It's nothing to be glorified, but it is what it is. And that was like the first step to really like being myself understanding why I do certain things. Mm -hmm. Cause when you don't have answers, like it's frustrating and then you get more frustrated and then you can go into this dark pit of just frustration and you start acting out. But like knowing like, okay, my balances are off. I might start doing this. Like that's, that's power to have that information. Like that, that's power. So my life changed by me kind of being able to be me, like really me, like, living in all of my truth mm -hmm. type of thing mm -hmm. so that's how my life changed and i would recommend like for anyone out there like you don't got to tell nobody if you don't want to but just for yourself like find what works for you like you were saying like you gotta find your rhythm like petting puppies cool mm -hmm. i like to make comics cool you like to play piano mm -hmm. whatever it is for you as long as you're not hurting nobody like find what works for you and it's perfectly fine and you're not crazy like that that is the most important thing I tell people is like, you're not, you're not crazy. Like, you're not. Like, this world is crazy and it'll have you thinking you're crazy and you're just, you're not crazy. It's hard. Life is hard, but if you find like, just balance, it's hard, but it's a journey. But yeah, again, I'm about to go on a tangent, so I'll cut it off. But <laughs> it changed because like, yeah, that's freedom. Like, we live in a world already like, all right, I'm a black man. So one, my body, like when I'm on the streets, already doesn't belong to me because it's perceived in a certain way. Then you add crazy on top of, like, you know, there's so much things, but being able to say like, oh, I'm not crazy, this is what I have, this is how I can deal with it, like that's freedom, like for real freedom. And so, yeah, I'm trying to help my people get free. Like not just black people, folks with mental health stuff, like we about to get free, so that's, yeah. I would like to open the floor up to questions. Go ahead, right there. And there's the mic behind you. One second. Thank you. I'm scared, but I prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something before while you're doing this? Yeah. <laughs> Waste the time. Um, I think also, like, the impression, um, you figure some things out, but, like, I will never probably figure out how to end this, you know, and, like, how to be calm every day. And, you know, you figure it out in some moments, but then you don't, and you're the baby again. You, uh, some, or you're a person who knows nothing and can't get out of it. Um, but I, you know, I, you have to give yourself credit for, like, you never know how bad things might have been if you would have done like an even worse job of handling it. <laughs> so, you know, so if I, you know, I feel like all guilty and like full of shame if I've wasted like my whole summer, you know, like lying down and crying or something. But, um, you know, theoretically, uh, <laughs> but like it could have been worse, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead. I'm set up now. Um, I wanted to know um, when kind of the, the crux of what you're doing is exposing your really, really personal struggles that are naturally really raw just because of what they are. Um, how do you set kind of personal and professional boundaries when that's the way your work is so that every interaction you're having isn't, oh, let's talk about your you know greatest personal trauma. Let's all chat about it. How do you kind of be a professional while you're kind of wearing your giant gaping wounds on your sleeve, so to speak, all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first, I mean, I, I think that putting it putting it out there that was that was part of how has your life changed is that it doesn't really feel like a huge gaping wound, kind of. I mean, I guess I talked yeah. to, I mean, like there's a lot of processing that goes along goes along with that. I mean, it's not a it's not a journal. This isn't something that we're doing for ourselves and putting you know like under you know like under lock and key because it's just for ourselves and on therapy. That's that's one of the things. One of the things that usually comes up is was it therapeutic and like uh, you know like putting out any work. I think would hope you'd hope would be you know like, yeah sure there's an element to that maybe a lot maybe you know certain parts or something but. Um, 
But um, boundaries are important, and they're not always easy. Yeah. That, I, I mean, I know I've kind of I've kind of learned over the years that that I'm going to have those pangs a lot, and that I I just have to. I, I've couldn't tell you specifically how I've like come to kind of like integrate that into interacting with readers and stuff, but. Mm -hmm. But the huge gaping wound part, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like that. I, I guess maybe I guess maybe part of it for me would be to have taken this really painful experience and I feel like I've transformed it into something positive. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've I've transformed it for myself, like look what I look what I've Look what I've done! Like I've I've come I've come this far. I'm strong, um, and then and then to be able to to give people those things that they're that they're saying, like the the space to say the things or dealing with the the things that they are, and inspiring other other people to do their to do their own creative work and that kind of thing. So some of it's the transformation. Some of its boundaries are just hard. They own those as yeah. always are. Um, I people don't try to talk to me about things. I think <laughs> they have had enough. <laughs> I don't need to make boundaries. <laughs> Unconsciously, I've done it. <laughs> um, yeah, I've only had like a few folks kind of overstep a little bit, and it wasn't overstepping. It was just they really needed to talk at the time. And so if I could hold that space for them, I was more than happy to. Mm -hmm. But then it got to the point where it was like, all right, like, I'm here for you, but you, you know, you gotta <laughs> kind of like give me some space too, because like if you read my work, you understand like the emotional toll is gonna take on me as well from hearing these things. And like, we need balance. Like you can't just pour it all out on me. But yeah, like, I'm okay. Like with folks, saying what they need to say. That's what my work is about, is me saying what I need to say, so I kind of expect, like, if you pick up the book, oh, you're gonna wanna talk about mental health. That's why you're picking up the book. Um, also, like I said, I'm very nice, but I have this kind of hard face. Not intentionally, but, so it keeps people at bay, like, oh, I don't know if I should talk to them, or if, like, but I, I'm nice, I promise. Like, you, <laughs> we could talk all day, like, yeah. But, um, I don't know. I think it's weird because I don't really see like uh, the professional boundaries because I'm so like, I'm about the people, but not in like a corny way. Like when I say it, I mean it and I'm really out here with the people. So it's like, I feel like you're approachable when you're with the people because I'm one of the people. So it's all right. Like I love it. Come, come talk to me. Uh, even if you don't want to buy nothing, if you just need an ear, like, yo, I had a hard day at the convention, there's too many people, I'm happy. No, that's real. <laughs> like, exactly. I think you'll get a long line if you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, time for one more. Go ahead, Kim. Hi. Um, Hi. I, this is a quick comment question. I, do I need the mic or can I just project? Is that okay? Just project real quick. Oh, right. Um, I, uh, when I told my best friend I had bipolar, she said to me, everybody has problems, Olivia. And that um, really instilled this doubt that I'm realizing now. And so my question for you is how do you deal with doubt? Because that seems to be like a, a force that drives whether or not I publish things. So I, I get scared a yeah. lot of the time. So how do you deal with that? That happens to me all the time. Um, yeah, and I, I have a hard time dealing with that um, because it's like, just talk to my husband, you know? <laughs> he, he doesn't doubt that my diagnosis. Um, but uh, I, you don't want to have to prove it, you know? Like, show them your worst side, right? But I, I think there is this, there's truth. You know, everybody does have a hard life. Everybody has, like, a lot to go through. And I think people don't want people want to have credit for the hard things that we all go through and i feel like people who somehow have you know not been diagnosed with anything ever feel like they're almost envious of people who are because they're getting something it might be attention it might be support it might be special services or accommodations or even just like the freedom to say I'm this way because I have bipolar, you know, and it explains it, like an explanation, and they can't explain why they just screamed at their partner, you know, um, or whatever. And 
I'm not saying, like, in my mind when someone says, you're not, you're not bipolar, you're not whatever, you don't really have these problems, everybody's that way. I feel like super defensive about it and it's like, no, I swear to God, it's worse, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but that's me, like, wanting, like, credit for what I've been through, maybe. Um, the truth is, you're the only person that really knows and you are responsible for taking care of yourself and everybody has the right to make excuses to get out of things. Like, you don't have to be diagnosed with something to say, I'm too tired to go to that. I'm not going to say that I'm too tired. I'm just going to say no. I'm going to RSVP no. Or I'm, I volunteer for something and it's time for me to back out. We don't owe anybody explanations, but I still find it like personally irritating. Like, if I have this, I should be able to use it for an excuse. Otherwise, like, it's good for nothing, you know? I want special treatment. Um, but that's not the way it is, you know? And I'm going through all this. I mean, I mentioned the MS thing, you know? Like, like bipolar, it comes with cognitive, you know, dysfunction. And my memory is, like, shot in a lot of ways. And I feel like I want to say to people, no, I really do want to remember your name. I really do wish I remember that conversation we had. But, like, I'm messed up in certain ways that I wasn't before. And it's like I'm trying to catch up with this. And, like... Um, but yeah, it's, that is one of the hardest things. And I think that's where the stigma is too, is like people kind of understand it and maybe they'll like allow, I mean, I don't know, why is that? Why don't people want you to be diagnosed? It's denial, it's also like your friends and people who love you don't wanna believe that you're going through something bad. They wanna think like, oh, but I'm reassured, you looked really good the other day, you know? And there's also like with bipolar, there's rapid cycling. So like, I might have been fine at three, p.m., you know, and not at 5 p.m. It's, like, really, it's so complicated, you know? Everybody just, like, deserves credit for getting up today and <laughs> being here. Well, I think it's, it's complicated is really kind yeah. of the, I mean, like, I, I don't know the situation. I mean, the bottom line is trust yourself. Um, but, like, yeah, probably maybe the friend doesn't know you in the the depths of, you know, like the things that you really struggle with. Maybe maybe they're actually trying to be kind. Um, yeah. Or maybe they're in their own denial. Like, I don't want my friend to be having that kind of problem. Or there is kind of a problem of over-diagnosis and yeah. over-pathologizing um, and it's like over-medicating. And, and bipolar disorder is kind of a popular diagnosis. Um, I know a lot of people who have this, you know, like, really, and we'll talk about it, and it sounds like there's more anxiety going on, armchair psychiatrist, not my role, but, um, but it just seems like there are a lot of different um, mental health diagnoses and things that are kind of floating around that even a lot of people who are doing the diagnosing aren't really, don't really entirely have a grip on. So, so, so far as that goes, it's really not cut and dry. But so far as getting, getting support for the stuff that you're going through, it, it can be really hard to find. That person might care about you a lot and you know it. We're, we're supposed to listen to our support system. I mean, it's really important, you know, like, if I'm, you know, like, you know, honey, you're not, You've been, you haven't been getting that much sleep for the past four nights. I mean, this isn't an actual example that I'm thinking of, but, you know, like, hearing from your partner, from the people who are close to you, but then also having to kind of gauge that their story is coming into play, too. So it's really complicated, and especially if you're not feeling, like, on top of things and that you're thinking really clearly. So it's, it's just a, a lot of different things to weigh, but really the bottom line to go back to as much as you can is to trust yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid with that we need to, our time is done for the, for the panel. Thank you so much to our panelists. <laughs>